whenever you're ready. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I will sit outside for the evening almost, right? Uh, so uh, today's uh, Dr. Leonard Weisenthal's closing series uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Joseph Kosminski. Uh, you probably know him as the chair of the physics department. Um, uh, Dr. Kosminski received his BS in physics and mathematics from a place called the University of Notre Dame. That's, of course, where he and I met. He then went on to get his uh, master's and PhD in high energy particle physics from Michigan State University. Uh, his uh, research work, his dissertation work, was uh, based off of D0, uh, and he's also a current collaborator at the MUDE experiment uh, at Fermi Lab. Uh, since coming to Lewis University, Dr. Kosminski has become uh, active in PER, the Physics Education Research. Um, he has chaired a subcommittee that wrote the uh, AABT American Phys uh, Association of Physics Teachers recommendations for the undergraduate laboratory curriculum and vice chair of the AABT committee uh, on the science education for, public, uh, for the public. Uh, and recently, Dr. Kosminski has now jumped into the public realm where he has actually been elected to the local board of education for his local sc uh, school district. Uh, furthermore, Dr. Kosminski is a pretty good golfer and also really likes East China Inn's cuisine. I know this for a fact. So please welcome Dr. Kosminski. Thank you. Um, yeah, I could use some Chinese right now after my Cliff Bar lunch during a meeting. Um, so, yeah, I, I started my um, career really in, in high energy physics. I've worked at Fermilab. I'm still um, you know, involved there. Um, but since coming to Lewis, I've um, gone in some other directions as well, uh, one of these being physics education research. And I've had the opportunity to really um, get involved in the laboratory uh, side of things in uh, physics education research. Um, and part of what um, I've been able to do um, is work on um, some recommendations um, for physics, undergraduate physics laboratories um, nationally. And where, where, there should be three pictures here um, that explain why uh, we want to focus on um, skill development in the physics lab. Um, don't know why these aren't showing up. But basically the uh, reasons that you'll uh, see on these plots if they decide to pop up is um, most physics majors don't go on to graduate school in physics and very few actually go into academia. Oh, that's not good. Well, we'll just continue on. Um, most don't go on to uh, graduate school uh, or don't go on into uh, physics and academia. Um, they go into industry, they go into engineering, they go into other uh, fields. And these, uh, and so when they go into uh, even graduate school, but uh, into industry, um, there are many um, skills that are needed um, that can be developed through a physics major. Um, you know, things like um, you know, communication skills, working on teams, solving technical problems, technical writing, um, you know, research skills, experimental skills, uh, computational skills. Um, so we were able to A bunch of my pictures have been lost. Um, we were able to um, put together a set of recommendations for the undergrad uh, lab curriculum that uh, focus on um, uh, a few um, main areas, uh, modeling, uh, designing experiments, uh, technical and analytical skills, uh, communication skills, and constructing knowledge. Um, and these recommendations provide learning outcomes and uh, lab experiences um, 
that will build skills instead of just verify uh, you know, different things in the lab, verify little g, right? Um, they really emphasize the importance of a hands-on laboratory experience and they provide scaffolding so that you're developing skills from your freshman year through your senior year. And here's the picture that was, uh, again, lost on the last page. Um, and I've been able to do some education research work around uh, some of these skills that we've um, put in these uh, recommendations. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is uh, lab notebooks at the introductory level. Um, a, uh, a couple of recommendations come in here. Uh, students should be able to record, organize uh, their observations, data, and results, um, basically in preparation for keeping a, uh, a professional lab notebook. And use their lab notebook as a record for explaining the details of their work in uh, written and oral summaries. So um, the, the actual technical skill of keeping a lab notebook and then extracting information from your lab notebook um, and, and uh, drawing evidence-based conclusions. We did a study um, over three semesters of General Physics I students. Um, this was with Mike Zwartz, who's now a high school teacher at Joliet Central. Um, we had uh, 41 students complete both the pre and post test uh, surveys. Um, this survey uh, consisted of 10 questions on general notebook practices. So, um, you know, things like, sh should you, um, you know, I, I th things like, um, uh, should you write in ink in a lab notebook, right? Things that are just very uh, kind of concrete. And then self-reported practices and attitudes. Um, I always sign and date my lab notebook, right? Those sorts of things. Um, demographics uh, of the uh, majors, or of the uh, students in this class um, are shown here. The majors were from uh, mainly physics and uh, chemistry. Um, and we took a little background data to find out what kind of um, knowledge they were coming in with. Um, so, you know, 13% of these students had no notebook training whatsoever in high school or in college uh, coming into the lab. Um, the rest had some uh, sort of training uh, in laboratory notebooks. Um, at the end, you know, everybody uh, did get some training. Um, and uh, they saw uh, that they, they got this in, in various um, methods. So what did we find? Um, we uh, took the data, we took the paired uh, Likert scale data and did a Wilcoxian uh, rank sums test analysis to uh, analyze it. Uh, we found significant shifts in four of the survey items. Um, three of them are good. Uh, when a mistake is made, it's acceptable to erase or white out or, and write over it. Um, students came in thinking that's fine, and they uh, left thinking uh, that you, know, you shouldn't do that sort of thing. Um, that they should put uh, supplementary data and graphs uh, into a lab notebook. Um, you know, they came in uh, you know, not prepared to do that, and, and in the end, uh, they um, uh, realized that that is a good notebook practice. Um, and then signing and dating notebooks, they came in saying, oh, we don't need to do that. Um, and at the end, uh, you know, they uh, at least claimed that they were doing that. There was one that actually shifted the wrong direction. Uh, a lab notebook should look like a lab report with an introduction of purpose, materials, methods, data, analysis, uh, and all that in that order. That's not how science is done. <laughs> right? You, you, your scientific process isn't linear. 
you're taking data, you're doing a little bit of analysis, you're realizing you, know, you, you don't understand what's going on, you're taking more data, you're um, you know, rethinking your apparatus, right? Um, you know, tweaking that. So um, it, it turned out there was you know, th this one issue that you know, we brought lab notebooks into the labs, um, but they were kind of saying the lab notebook is a lab report. Um, and you know, a, a number of students um, you know, did say on, on, another, um, on another one, they didn't have a significant shift. In high school, they kind of filled things out at the end, and in physics lab, they kind of filled things out at the end. So um, they weren't necessarily taking notebook, uh, the data and the um, information in their notebooks uh, as they went along. Something happened to a bunch of my figures, apparently. Um, so we also looked at um, useful uh, notebook instruction methods and um, useful um, feedback methods. And um, the um, notebook instruction methods the um, primary, um, th th they found you know, getting some overview in class to be useful, but they found instructor um, you know, feedback, uh, uh, you know, kind of that repetitive process of going through and looking at the notebook um, to be uh, very useful as well. Um, the direct instructor feedback um, was also the most useful feedback uh, method. Um, Basically, uh, yeah, I, I like this one quote, uh, we were actually able to meet uh, with him and get feedback, which was intimidating, but also substantially beneficial. Um, I don't know, I think Dr. Hooper probably taught that lab, right? It's pretty intimidating. Um, most of the students uh, agreed or strongly agreed uh, that their lab notebook skills improved over the course of the semester. We're going to stick on uh, communication, and uh, another thing that um, I've been involved in is the Journal of the Advanced um, Undergraduate Physics Laboratory Investigation. Um, it's currently being kind of um, updated. Um, this came out of a, a discussion. Um, after you know, some meetings uh, at the 2009 Topical Conference on Advanced Labs. Um, you know, we were sitting around in a local establishment um, discussing how we can improve uh, student um, writing in the labs. And uh, in more authentic forms, not, not the strict lab reports. So we uh, implemented um, this journal hosted by uh, Mark Masters at uh, Indiana Fort Wayne. And um, it, it was, it led students through the journal process of submission, peer review. Uh, we did double blind peer review um, with uh, students from other institutions. So at the height of Jopley, um, there were nine or 10 institutions across the US uh, participating. So, you never peer reviewed somebody from your own class, which meant nobody else knew what you were doing in the lab. You had to communicate it to them, right? Your friends weren't going to give you a nice peer review. So um, this was a nice opportunity to understand that uh, submission and publication uh, process for the students. Um, unfortunately, uh, their server crashed in the middle of the 2017-2018 um, uh, uh, school year, um, and Fort Wayne never brought it back up online. Um, we kind of scrambled um, for a, a year or two trying to do things through Excel. It didn't work terribly well um, in terms of um, keeping records. Um, and in uh, 
2020, uh, we pushed it to the Advanced Lab Physics Association, and um, a, a couple of uh, people have taken over and are trying to um, get this back online. So hopefully we'll be able to bring it back to Lewis um, in the next few years. <clears throat> So what were the uh, benefits? Well, it de developed uh, communication skills. It's not just another uh, lab report. Um, they're writing for an audience of their peers, right? They're, writing, they're not writing for me. They're writing for the people who are reading it, who are peer reviewing it. Um, it gave a scientific, you know, kind of, kind of created a scientific community where they were active participants. Was it extra work to read two papers from People they didn't know, yeah, it was. But um, yeah, they didn't mind, right? It, it was a good experience for them. Um, it built in a rigorous um, assessment mechanism, right? Um, th there was feedback from two peers, there was feedback from an editor, which were the instructors. Um, and it exposed students to physics experiments they might not see at their home institution. So, um, you know, what, what students had to do was, you know, going off the uh, communicating physics piece of the recommendations, learn uh, to present reasoned arguments supported by experimental evidence, um, and use authentic styles so that they're ready when they go into graduate school. I don't know what happened to all of my graphics. Um, And something happened in that um, uh, transfer to the flash drive. Um, so we found um, uh, that, that students in general agreed uh, or strongly agreed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Little pause for um, technical difficulties here. We need some elevator music or something, I think. Thank you. No, it's not displaying correctly still. All right, well, we'll, we'll just uh, keep on going. Um, I don't know what's going on. Um, so apparently if you want to rewatch this afterward, uh, everything's working fine on the, uh, on the video. Um, so students um, agreed or strongly agreed with um, all of these uh, different prompts uh, in general. Um, they 
uh, got a greater understanding of the scientific uh, peer review process, um, writing uh, a manuscript for an unknown person um, helped their understanding of the experiment. Um, the paper they reviewed was um, difficult to understand. Um, and let me tell you, the hardest reviewers are students on each other. The, the comments were, were, were great. I mean, and, and, and they were thoughtful and, um, you know, uh, you know, they, they, they really kind of um, hit the, um, the, the weak parts of, of the papers and really you know, gave good feedback to the uh, authors. Um, scientific writing skills uh, improved uh, due to participation in this. <clears throat> By reviewing another student's paper, I realized I might be making uh, similar mistakes. Um, there are some really good comments on this. Uh, I need to make more of an effort to write as if the audience has little to no knowledge of the concepts and procedures used in the paper. Um, when I was reading through the paper, I noticed certain things that, that they did, basically. Um, and uh, I noticed I did the same thing. Right, so they're reading somebody else's paper and realizing I'm doing that too. Um, I felt like a complete hypocrite while writing the review, right? Um, so there, there was some good self-reflection uh, going on as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, students in general really um, liked participating uh, in, in this um, experience. Yeah, they said it was hard. Right, it was time consuming, but um, they learned a lot uh, from this process. Right? But they only did it once. They wrote one uh, journal article and they did two peer reviews. Right? It wasn't a, a journal article on every lab that they did. <clears throat> um, we also hit um, not just the technical side of things, but the entire uh, range of focus areas when we think about uh, developing experiments. And uh, another thing that I've been interested in is um, having students develop low-cost laboratory apparatus, um, which can be accessible to many more institutions, right? If we think about, you know, uh, um, something that costs thousands of dollars, not every institution is going to be able to buy that. If we can bring that price down, 3D print components, use laser pointers instead of Heaney lasers, we can make it available, accessible to, you know, pretty much any college and many high schools as well. Um, and I'm going to show just a couple examples of um, some work students have done in this area. Um, a few years ago, uh, Steve Hiller um, wanted to do a project in wireless power transmission. Um, he hand wound uh, pancake coils, um, had several different uh, input voltages, and basically um, built a, a wireless power device that was run off of DC by um, putting a transistor in the circuit that act as a, acted as a switch. So you get the uh, alternating current that you need for this um, wireless power transmission. Um, and you know, th this was a really nice design. It cost, um, all the parts together cost less than $50. Um, and you know, we took it to um, Washington, D.C. for the AEPT uh, apparatus competition and it won first place. And it wasn't first place in the low-cost apparatus. He won first place overall. So this was a, a really creative um, project. Um, and he designed the apparatus, but um, you know, he also designed some experiments around it. Um, you know, what happens uh, as we, uh, uh, well, how, how can we increase the separation of the uh, pancake coils? 
right? Or how does the um, uh, addition of um, voltage to the transmitter allow us to uh, increase separation of the uh, pancake coils? He did a whole range of studies um, and, and developed this into a nice lab. Um, currently, um, Alexis and um, Mike Vargas are, work, uh, are working on a uh, dipole and quadrupole scattering apparatus. Um, this was a, a workshop I went to um, at that Ann Arbor meeting in 2009. Um, and it was a really cool uh, experiment where you could uh, actually visually see uh, dipole and quadrupole light scattering in a fluid. Um, the setup that you know, was used you know, was several thousand dollars, a uh, Heaney laser, a uh, uh, goniometer stage, all, all kinds of, um, you know, really nice optics. Um, Alexis and Mike have um, figured out how to 3D print all the materials. They um, are, are using Arduino, uh, an Arduino light sensor to read it out. Um, that costs about ten dollars, um, and are using a laser pointer instead of a Heaney laser. Um, we've got the cost down, well, probably under one hundred fifty dollars. One twenty, right? So we're looking at a twenty-five hundred dollar experiment. You know, we were able to get very comparable results to the um, you know, professional grade uh, experiment. And uh, th this is an early design. Um, this was uh, one that they um, submitted for the 2020 uh, Celebration of Scholarship. And uh, they were uh, Schlachter Award uh, finalists. Um, 2020 Celebration of Scholarship didn't actually go on. So finalist was kind of as good as he could get. Um, but now this is in uh, probably about the fourth iteration. Um, and they've added some uh, light tighting and, and all kinds of other things to um, you know, improve on uh, the experiment. So my next slide's not really going to work without the figures uh, all showing up. Um, but the, um, the, the lab recommendations um, give us a pathway from freshman year to senior year and how we develop skills um, during that time. The, wouldn't it be great to have students coming in with um, some of these skills already developed? Right? So um, something else that's important is um, building bridges from high school to um, college. And um, that's actually being done. Okay? The, um, there again, is supposed to be additional uh, pictures over here. NGSS happened to show up. Um, NGSS is a... Um, set of science standards for the high schools. Uh, Illinois is an adopter um, of the NGSS. And there are, uh, it's not just content standards. It's not the multiple choice science tests that um, I took when I was uh, in grade school, right? Um, it does involve the core disciplinary ideas, the content, but it also involves science and engineering practices. And if you look at this list, you can map the NGSS science and engineering practices to the focus areas in the lab recommendations. The um, NGSS hadn't been released officially, but there were drafts of it um, available when we were working on the lab recommendations. And we really you know, wanted to make sure that there was a good uh, pathway to go from high school to uh, college. Um, and then uh, also kind of these um, ideas that, that cut across all uh, types of the sciences, right? 
um, physics, chemistry, um, biology, engineering, uh, everything. So, in order to uh, effectively do this, we need to um, fill a big need that's out there. Uh, there's a big need for physics and chemistry teachers in the high schools. Currently, less than 50% of high school physics classes are being taught by uh, a, a teacher that has any sort of physics degree, including a, a physics minor. Chemistry is in roughly the same boat. I think that number is about 50%. Okay, so um, we need students who have uh, physics and chemistry degrees in the high school classroom. Um, there's also representation uh, issues within the classroom. Um, students in a lot of schools don't see somebody who looks like them in a science classroom. And studies have shown that if a student goes into the classroom and sees someone of the same gender or the same race or ethnicity, they get this idea that maybe I can do that, right? They may not want to, but that could be a pathway for me. So increasing representation among uh, physics and chemistry teachers is also uh, really important. Physics, math, and chemistry are actually the highest demand academic areas in high schools throughout the United States and in Illinois. Um, so with you know, a degree in, uh, in any of those, or if you are certified to teach in multiple, right, if you teach physics and math, you, know, you, you have a job waiting for you. Physics teachers, um, also rate their lives as quite good, right? Um, this is a, a study of um, a, a, a whole group of people in various professions uh, rating uh, kind of their, um, uh, how they rate their lives, how they rate the quality of life. And uh, only uh, physicians responded higher than teachers. I will note that this was a pre-COVID study <laughs> um, so hopefully we'll get back to this. Um, but you know, if you think about, you know, even during COVID, the teachers are in the classroom doing their job, right? Doctors and nurses are, are in the hospitals doing their job, right? My wife's a doctor. She was in the hospital in March, April, May, 2020, when all of us were you know, teaching from home and learning from home. So, why? Just think about it for yourself. Why do you think teachers rate their lives highly compared to other professions? Anybody want to throw out a... Pay. Uh, pay? Uh, they kind of enjoy helping others, so they yeah. kind of a good feeling from it. Yeah, so helping others, right? Um, so all of those are actually important, right? There's some work-life balance. There's um, that relationship with students and uh, colleagues. And there's financial stability. The um, you know, students are the main reason teachers do the job, right? That's why the teachers are, you know, in the schools doing whatever they need to do. I mean, I have, uh, you know, middle school kids now. One of them was in elementary school uh, last year still. Um, the teachers were just incredible in terms of what they were doing in the schools for the kids.
what's the, it, and um, you, you can respond to this by um, giving me a show of your uh, fingers, one, two, three, four, five. Um, what do you think the average uh, starting salary, median starting salary for a, a bachelor's degree teacher graduates from our program, goes out into the workforce is? Sing ones, twos, threes. John's pretty optimistic back there. <laughs> um, and I'll show you all the uh, data. Just remember what you uh, guessed. How about a master's degree? Master's plus zero. So uh, you get your bachelor's, you get your master's degree, and then you go into the workforce. Sing basically a shift, threes to fours, uh, some fives. <laughs> That's right, it better be an upward shift. Um, how about starting salaries for, uh, or, or these aren't starting salaries, how about salaries for a master's plus 15 years? So you're mid-career, you're doing all of the professional development and everything, um, and working your way up the pay scales. So here we're seeing uh, a lot of fours, fives, some threes and twos. Um, so right now um, I have a FizTech uh, recruiting grant. Um, FizTech is an organization that is engaged in recruiting teachers nationally. Um, Hoff is on it and Dr. Hiver in education is also uh, on that grant. And um, what we've done is we've collected data uh, for the entire Chicagoland area on teacher salaries, um, housing, uh, cost of living, a, a bunch of other uh, uh, data okay, um, that we can compare with. Um, I want to thank Drew Isola from uh, Get the Facts Out, um, which is an, another organization uh, trying to increase the number of STEM teachers nationally. Um, he kind of helped us with the first few districts, you know, showing us what data to uh, collect. Um, Dr. Hooper mentioned that I'm on a school board, so I was actually familiar with teacher contracts. So I went through every teacher contract in Cook and the Collar Counties and pulled data on, um, on these. So, if you guessed fifty thousand dollars for a median bachelor's plus zero, um, that is the correct answer. Fifty-five thousand for the median master's plus zero, and ninety-three thousand for median uh, master's plus fifteen years. Okay. Um, one thing you'll notice is the more urban counties tend to have um, higher teacher salaries, okay? Um, the ones that have a larger uh, rural component, um, you see, you know, for example, Will County has a huge range of um, teacher salaries, right? Whether you're um, in, in, you know, Joliet area or whether you're in, um, you know, South Will County, you know, in the very rural areas. So there's quite a spread. Um, but you also have a much lower cost of living in Will County compared to other parts of the Chicagoland uh, area. Um, but regardless, you know, with these median home values, you can afford to buy a house on a teacher's salary in any of these areas. Here's uh, where bachelor degree teachers go uh, in terms of um, um, you know different sectors, uh, private sector, um, this may be hard to read, um, right, private sector types of jobs, civilian government jobs, um, high school teachers, you'll notice are shifted very low. In the Chicago land area, our starting salaries are in line with uh, you know, private sector 
kind of that, the lower end of private sector jobs. In Illinois, the average household income is $67,000. So by the time you're 15 years in, you're making, on your own, well above that average income in Illinois. This is a nine-month base salary. And um, there's a, a pension uh, that, that gets paid into. And uh, you can retire before you're 60 years old. In Illinois, um, you can actually start retiring at age 55 if you have 30 years of service. And then there are additional opportunities. Um, if you coach something, if you uh, uh, mentor a club, um, those are all built into the contracts. You get so much for coaching football and so much for coaching um, volleyball, and you get so much for uh, coaching the chemistry club. Um, there are also opportunities um, for pro professional development. Um, where you, know, you, you can uh, make some income during the summer. Um, National Science Foundation runs uh, a program similar to REUs for teachers. They're called uh, RETs, Research Experiences for Teachers. Um, and uh, the CorkNet Group um, is a, a national uh, uh, association uh, of kind of high schools. It's uh, led by Notre Dame and Fermilab. And um, they put cosmic ray detectors in high school classrooms. Students have access to the data. Teachers, well, pre-COVID, go to Fermilab for two weeks during the summer, all expenses paid and a stipend for workshops. So, you know, in general, um, there's kind of a negative view sometimes, I think, of teaching as a profession. But it's actually um, that there are a lot of benefits to this career pathway. So yeah, if you're interested, um, you know, please um, talk to one of us. Um, we have several ways to get a teaching degree here at Lewis. Um, if you're earlier in your uh, college career, you can um, get a bachelor's uh, in uh, either physics or chemistry. Uh, th this applies to chemistry as well. Um, and you know, be out in uh, you know, four years. Um, you can do a four plus one where you get a bachelor's degree in physics or chemistry and then a master's degree in secondary ed in one more year. Um, if you finish your degree and you decide, you know, you know, maybe you spend a couple years in industry and then you say, no, I really want to teach, you can come back and get a master's degree. Um, if you have any, um, if you want to talk more about this, uh, please feel free to contact me um, or uh, Dr. Bixby in uh, chemistry. So, how do we implement these things? Um, how do we implement the lab recommendations widely? How do we grow? Uh, STEM teacher numbers uh, nationally. Well, we need, we need some help. We need money. And we need advocacy. So we need to talk to our funding agencies. We need to talk to um, you know, corporate sponsors. We need to talk to politicians and try to get funding. You can do this in a number of ways. Um, with the American Association of Physics Teachers, um, some of us last year worked on a white paper to define um, specific funding initiatives that we're trying to get uh, to the NSF um, for kind of the, the coming future. Modernizing instructional physics labs 
and kind of bringing in computation is the number one priority. With things like the National Quantum Initiative, with things like climate change, um, with things like the National Photonics Initiative, our labs are, we need infrastructure. Um, the last time the NSF funded laboratory equipment was in the early 2000s. So we're 15 years out from, you know, good laboratory funding. So that's something that we're advocating for, right? And we're talking to anybody we can about this sort of thing. Um, we just need to sit down and talk about the physics curriculum, right? Modern physics is now 100 years old, right? And every physics major on the planet has a modern physics class, right? Are we still covering the right things? Are we still, um, you know, doing what we need to do to make sure that students are prepared for the workforce, right? And yes, you do need modern physics to, you know, bridge to quantum mechanics and, and some of these other things. Um, but, you know, we also know a lot from physics education research. How can we be more effective about teaching physics? Um, we need, uh, again, uh, this idea of, of um, diversity and representation. Um, we need funding to try to, um, you know, bring more diversity into uh, physics. And um, two-year physics, or two-year colleges um, have a number of uh, challenges and um, you know, they're trying to build a, a national you know, consortium uh, to you know, kind of form that community um, that's much needed in their, in their group. <coughs> Uh, communicating with um, funders and politicians in person, talking to them, uh, is important. Um, but we can't communicate as scientists. We can't give a big wit search and talk about all the cool data and then wrap it up. We've lost them. They're thinking about their next meeting. You need to tell them the story, you need to tell them the punchline, right? Right up front, one sentence, maybe two. Tell what, you know, how, what, why is this relevant? How does it uh, impact? And provide a couple of supporting details. Um, AAAS has a, a phenomenal center for public engagement um, and a nice communication um, uh, workshop. And, uh, you know, th this idea um, is something that's not often taught in, um, at, at the university level. It's not taught in the science programs. Um, we piloted a workshop last uh, spring, um, Dr. White and I, and um, part of this was on communication. Um, most students didn't have uh, any experience to delivering an elevator pitch, kind of the short, it has to be short, 30 seconds, a minute. Um, delivering an elevator pitch before taking the class. Um, a, a couple had, I'd done it in a couple of my courses before. Um, and this workshop, they, they felt really helped them develop communication skills. Um, they felt more confident about writing and delivering uh, an elevator pitch. And, um, you know, felt that, that something like this should be more integrated throughout the curriculum. Um, right, it's not something that, that's uh, standardly, or uh, typically taught uh, in physics. And if you want to do more than that, um, you can jump into the fray, or help somebody jump into the fray. Um, there aren't enough scientists engaged in the public dialogue. We can talk about, um, you know, kind of the, the evidence behind a lot of national issues, 
right? Climate change issues, public health issues, um, you know, education issues. Scientists have a role in helping to define public policy. And, you know, one way that, that um, some scientists are getting involved is running for public office, right? Bill Foster is one that we've had to campus uh, before. He's a representative uh, from the area. Um, he's a PhD physicist. I grew up in a district that had a, rep a PhD physicist as a representative uh, back in Michigan. Um, I jumped into the fray. I, I, I ran for my local school board. Um, I'm on the Naperville uh, 203 school board right now. Um, you know, it wasn't a talk with Bill Foster that made me think about it. It was a talk with a scientist at Fermilab who ran for a park district board in Aurora. The scientists are stepping up and running for these local, um, you know, local positions even. Um, so, you know, we, we need scientists to advocate to Congress. We need scientists to talk to funding agencies. Um, and we need scientists to be involved in government. Um, just about out of time here. So um, if you are interested in any, anything that I've uh, talked about, um, there are a lot of avenues available for physics education research. Um, the recommendations have so many research questions embedded in them. And physics lab uh, research is still very much, um, is still kind of at the beginning stages. Um, there are a few groups who are doing some really good things in physics lab um, you know, education. But there are still a lot of untapped areas. Um, developing uh, low-cost apparatus, right? If you have an idea, um, talk to one of your professors. Right? It's a good project. It could be a good capstone project for you. Um, and then I've also jumped into uh, another project that um, I, I was hoping to put a couple slides together for today, but we're not quite at a, a good point. It's a, a fairly recent um, work on uh, climate vulnerability mapping in Will County. Um, this is a collaboration with the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, Texas A&M, um, Warehouse Workers for Justice, um, the Will County Coalition on Climate Justice and a couple of other things. Um, Dan uh, Blanco is, uh, really spearheaded this. Um, he was doing some you know, climate studies. We were, we were doing some climate studies and um, he was able to make this connection. And, and now um, you know, Lewis is very much uh, involved and is um, you know, helping out with this effort uh, in Will County. Um, stay tuned for to details. Um, we're, we have some data analysis going on right now, um, but it's uh, kind of embargoed until we uh, get a report out. So um, I can't talk about it at the moment. Um, and I want to thank the NSF and the um, uh, uh, American Physical Society um, for the um, PhysTech grant um, that supported uh, the high school teacher portion of this uh, talk. Any questions? <laughs> Apologize for the technical difficulties with the <laughs> slides. <laughs> it's always fun to have a bunch of pictures and then they don't show up. Approach them. You mentioned that one of the things we need advocacy 
and yep. communication in the public? That's a great question. And getting your foot in the door is actually the most important thing. So the way you approach them is you figure out what they're passionate about, right? If you're talking to um, a representative from Kansas, you're going to approach that discussion very differently than a representative from you know, the middle of Chicago, right? But there are climate impacts on both, right? Middle of Kansas, you're, you're probably going to talk about agriculture, right? Impact on agriculture. Middle of Chicago, you're going to talk about um, uh, a whole bunch of heat island effects. You're going to talk about um, air quality. You're going to talk about a whole bunch, uh, you know, potentially things like uh, other environmental uh, issues with, um, you know, flooding and, and things. You have to kind of know who you're talking to in advance. So you have to do your homework. You can't just you know, have the same pitch for everybody. Um, but that, that's a really, really critical point. If you start talking to, you know, a, a representative from a rural district about problems in Chicago, that's a non-starter, right? Um, so what's going on in their district, right? What are they concerned about and what are their constituents concerned about? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Joe, so have you by any chance uh, raked in some data on, like, like let's, let's say, say just, just how often your AT undergrad curriculum recommendations have been, have been cited? cited? As an indication of how, you know, whether, whether it's been disseminated yeah. broadly across the So, um, I haven't specifically uh, gathered that, but I, I do see them showing up, you know, more and more frequently in uh, publications. One of the issues is um, they're kind of published at different places, so they're not always cited the same way. So, that was a mistake on our part. We should have, you know, we, we kind of published an official report through AAPT, but then uh, it, it didn't get, you know, its own DOI number. Um, so it, it um, yeah, that, that's a, a really good question, but you know, kind of qualitatively, I've seen them showing up uh, in, in quite a few um, laboratory-based uh, articles. Um, and, and they show up at um, talks at, at AAPT conferences uh, frequently. And they're going to be referenced in um, the EP3 laboratory um, guidelines, which are hopefully going to be coming out this winter. All right. Well, if, there, uh, if there's nothing else, uh, thank you for um, coming out today. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to talk to me afterward, I'm happy to stick around. <laughs>